All right. So welcome to Grim Trigger, saying no to audit. I know giving a talk about audit is usually challenging because people run and hide thinking that they're going to get audited afterwards, but that's not the case here. I'm actually going to teach you guys how to say no to audit. If, I don't know if any of you have had an audit, been through an audit, deal with auditors, are auditors, aren't auditors, what your feelings are, but hopefully after this, if you haven't had an audit, or even if you had and you haven't been able to say no to your auditors, you feel more confident in being able to say no to them because they are not the end-all be-all. And I used to be one, as you'll see here. So, who am I and why should you listen to me about saying no to auditors? Um, I am a former auditor. I spent 10 years auditing uh, state, go uh, state and local governments in the state of Ohio. I worked for the Auditor of State's office. And um, after 10 years there, I decided that I needed to make a change. So I went into the private sector, into the financial services as an internal auditor. Um, so first I was an external auditor, then internal, and my manager at the time told me that I was going from the least restrictive environment to the most restrictive environment. So I was kind of excited because auditing governments can be very demoralizing when you realize that there really are no controls and you're pretty much going in and telling people what they need to do. Um, then three years ago, I decided that um, not having my heart was too burdensome and so I had it surgically put back in and became a security professional because if you don't know to become an auditor you do have to have your heart removed you can't be a heart heartfelt person so I had that put back and and now um, I've been in the security profession for about three years I'm also a husband a father um, three of my boys are here today my daughter's back home with my wife um, I'm also an amateur cook and um, I write haiku I published a book on it um, and I have blogged about it. So those are some other interesting facts about me. So I'm not all that kind of a bad guy just because I was an auditor. Um, and I also go by Ghost Nomad. If you're on Twitter, that's where you can find me. Now, before I go any further, I do need to warn you that the views expressed here are mine and mine alone. They don't represent my friends, family, coworkers, employer, or any other person who may or may not know me or anything I may say or not in the future. So with that said, I want to kind of start you off with some knowledge about what audits are. If you haven't been through one, even if you had, this might be a good refresher. I tend to break audits down into four types. There's your regulatory audits. Those are when the regulators come in and they have very specific things they're looking for. You can think of these things whether on a uh, technology level, like if you're in financial services, that'd be the government, the OCC, the using FFIEC standards. If you're in a regulated industry, you know, air quality standards, safety standards, those types of things. Regulatory audits um, are kind of a different animal, and saying no to your regulators is a lot harder <laughs> than um, saying no to some of the other type of auditors. So although you may try some of the techniques I, I give you today, you might want to go a little more cautiously with regulators. Where I'm more familiar with is the financial and the service provider audits. Uh, in a financial audit, that's where Somebody's coming in because your company um, sells stock or has people who invest in your company and you have to provide accurate information as to uh, what they're investing in. And so in a financial audit, even though it says financial audit and those are your statements, you do have to have certain controls at a security level and people are going to look at those controls. Service provider audit, if, you, if you're familiar with the SAS 70 or the SSA E16, that's when you provide a service to several other companies. Probably the best example is like a payroll company. They uh, do payroll for several companies. So somebody comes in, they audit specific controls around that um, thing that they're providing, and then they report back to the companies that use that service. And the reason is because then the financial auditors for that company use that to, to make decisions about your control environment over the thing that you don't do yourself. And finally, I kind of lump everything else into what I call compliance audits. This is like your PCI DSS, FISMA compliance, those types of things. Those are looking for a real specific um, thing. And again, compliance auditors might not be as forgiving as your financial uh, auditors because they have, they have a, a very specific checklist that they want to get through. They might be a little more forgiving than regulators, but um, they can still be not as much leeway there. So you want to tread lightly with your your uh, compliance auditors. So that's the way I classify audits um, and it's important to know what kind of audit you're having 
before you do any of this other stuff. Uh, the next thing I want to do is kind of drill down into the footsteps of auditors because they're going to use a lot of terms that you might not be familiar with. And if you don't know what they're saying to you, then you might be not understanding what they're asking for. You might not be giving them the right information. Of course, all this is going to lead up to how you're going to say no to them in the future. So some of the audit terminology that you'll hear is scope. That's, that's probably the most important thing for you to understand if you're being audited is what is the scope of the audit? And it's, it's a very basic thing. It's what the auditors are looking for. So if you're having a financial statement audit, your auditors are coming in, they want to make sure that, that the, the financial report you're putting out is accurate. So any controls that may follow those numbers that get onto your financial report is within their scope. If it doesn't fall within their scope, they don't need to know about it. Um, so in the example of a compliance audit with PCI DSS, the scope is restricted to what's in the PCI zone. Now, if you put too much in your PCI zone, their scope gets a lot bigger. If you can really restrict just PCI data into a zone, then the, the scope of what they're looking at becomes a lot smaller, and they don't have to ask you as many things about different, different areas, and it's a lot easier to, to maintain your controls. Um, Test the details. You won't hear this as much if you're on the technology side. This is more when they go in and they actually pull transactions and look at the detail of the transaction. This is going to be your, your CFO's responsibility on the finance side to, to get the information they need. Now, if it's electronically stored, they may come to you and say, hey, could you pull all these things? And this is literally looking at canceled checks and, and that type of stuff, going through a transaction in the system. So where you may need to pull data for somebody for this, a lot of times auditors aren't going to come to you for, for what they call their test of details. What you're really more concerned about as a security professional or technologist is what they call test of controls. Test of controls in an audit, you have you first look at controls, then you look at the test of details. By having good controls in your environment, they have to do less work on the details side. So they're really looking for, you know, do you have segregation of duties? Do you have proper authorization of transactions? Are you properly limiting people to getting into systems? As security professionals, that's one of our biggest things is access, um, authorization, and authentication. So they may be really coming to you and hitting you hard over, you know, what are, what are your active directory requirements over passwords and things like that. Um, those are the types of controls that audit will be looking for. And, and this is really where you're going to get, make sure that whatever your control standards are, are what you're doing, because that's where they're going to find the, the errors. And if something, if you have controls in place that you've written down that you don't do anymore for a specific reason, you need to go back and remove those from your control documents, because auditor's scope, going back to the first term, should be limited to what management controls are. So if it's not a control, they shouldn't be looking at it unless you're lacking a very significant control. And at that point, then they would have a finding, which leads into the last term that you're going to hear from audit, and that's your audit findings. And this is where everybody freaks out because this is where auditors start to get their bad rap. Audit findings are, we found that you didn't do what you said you were supposed to do. Now, it doesn't mean that you specifically didn't do it, but somebody along the way didn't do what they were supposed to do in the test of controls. So if you have change controls in, in place and somebody goes into your firewall and adds a configuration and they didn't properly document it and didn't get the proper approvals, the auditor is going to be breathing down your neck as to, well, why didn't you follow your control structure? There's three types of audit findings. Um, the first audit finding is the worst, and this is really where you don't want to be. And that is um, what they call a reportable condition. As I said, auditors put out a report that have, a, have, have what their opinion is about your financial statements. And they can either say, we found nothing, the environment's great, you can trust the numbers that are in it, invest in this company. Which means we all get raises and bonuses and stuff like that, right? <laughs> At least we hope. Um, the second type is, well, we found some deficiencies, but we don't think they're significant enough that the financial statements are, are inaccurate. You're still okay here. You're still you're still in good shape, but you're going to need to be fixing things, and investors are going to know what you did wrong. This may start to affect the way you're evaluated on your performance. 
Uh, the next level down is what they call a management letter uh, finding. That's where they put a letter together and they give it to your management, whether it's your C-level management, whether it's your, um, you know, at, at your department level, whatever. They're going to put together this thing that says, okay, these are things that you said you do, but you really didn't do it, but we don't think they're going to have an impact on the numbers that are in the financial statements. That's good, but you still have some things you need to clean up. Um, you have a lot more leeway here as to, to getting things removed. Um, as you did at the at the top level, where you have a little, it's going to be a little more tight, and you're going to take a lot more convincing at the reportable condition level. And finally, there's what they call the verbal finding. That's where they're going to tell you, well, you know, you said that um, when people are on vacation, they're not supposed to have access, and they had access. It really doesn't have an impact on the financial statements. It's really not that significant to our test, but you should really fix this. Um, you still need to correct it because they're going to write that down in their audit. Um, notes and they're going to check on it next year but at least if you decide not to correct it you need to document why so when they come back it's not going to be oh you forgot about it now we're going to escalate it up to the management level and if it was management letter level you didn't document it now we're going to escalate it up to reportable so it's important no matter what you do with the final audit findings you do get um, that you you document what you did so Hopefully this terminology helps you with dealing with your auditors. There's a lot of other things that they're going to say and do, but at least these are the, the audit terms, if you will, that sometimes get lost. So before I tell you how to say no to your auditor, I want to explain to you the grim trigger. So about a year ago, I took a, a course on model thinking. And if you've ever done anything with modeling, it also deals with game theory. Um, and probably the most notable game theory, the most iterative game that, that people hear about is the prisoner's dilemma. The idea that two people are locked in a prison and if you give information on the other person, you'll get out with less, with less time. If you cooperate and don't give information out, you're going to stay in the longest. You know, so there's, there's these different strategies for, you know, giving the other person up. So if I rat on you first, I can be more beneficial, but if we work together, it's probably the best benefit for both of us, and if we don't work together at all, it's just going to fall apart. Well, within these game, these iterative games, there's a strategy called tit for tat. And what tit for tat says, it's very simple. And in most of these iterative games, the strategies are simple. Tit for tat says, I'm going to start the game by being nice to you. And in return, on your turn of the game, you're going to be nice back to me. Now, in the next turn, if I decide, I'm going to stab you in the back. Then on your turn, you're going to stab me in the back. The only way I can correct this is on the next turn then, being nice back to you, and then you'll be nice back to me. They found that tit for tat is probably the most successful game theory strategy on these simple games, these iterative games, out of any other game strategy. But what they don't take into consideration and what they found out later is this idea of the grim trigger. And what the grim trigger basically says is that once I do something to you that stabs you in the back, you will never be nice to me again. doesn't matter how nice I be to you going forward, you will never, ever be nice to me until the game is over. This could have catastrophic um, results. And if you're a, if you're a literary um, fanatic and, and you read J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Probably the literative equivalent to this is the way that Frodo Baggins works with um, Gollum, a.k.a. Smeagol, whereas on his journey he's nice to, to Gollum and finds out where he used, what he used to be and that he used to be a hobbit. And, and so Smeagol in return is nice to Frodo and he gives him things back. But once Frodo or Sam are mean to Smeagol, he goes back to being Gollum and tries to, to undermine his, his journey to the, to the tower to destroy or to the to Mordor to destroy the ring. So that's probably a, a literary uh, way of looking at tit for tat. And in the end, as we all know, Gollum overcame with his desire for the ring. And so that could possibly be a grim trigger, not saying it is. But that could be a, a literary version of the grim trigger. So I've kind of given you some understanding of what audit's saying. And now I've told you about this idea of grim trigger. And the reason that's important in saying no to audit is because what we want to avoid when we say no to audit is that grim trigger. We don't want audit to just completely shut us down because we go about saying no to them the wrong way. 
So you say, I can't, there's no way I can say no to audit. They're audit. We always have to do what audit says, but that's not actually the case. When I was an auditor, I never told people that they had to do this, and if they told me no, they were done. I, I never did that. Now, you're going to have auditors that are like that. And you have to gauge the person you're dealing with before you try to, in, you know, go through and say, I'm not going to do this. Um, but the important thing in saying no to audit is that auditors only know what you tell them. So if they come in and they say, well, you say that your password policies are X, Y, and Z. Can you show me a report that shows that that's what your settings are in your Active Directory? Sure. So you print it out, and they find out that, well, this one thing here, let's say the timeouts, isn't actually 20 minutes, it's 40 minutes. Okay? There's an audit finding because it's not what you said it was. Well, what they may not know is that that's an Active Directory setting, but within your applications, you're kicking them out after five minutes. Okay? So, so just because you tell the auditors what they want to hear or what they've asked for doesn't mean you've given them all the information that's actually making their decision the proper one. So that's where understanding the scope and the test of controls that they're doing, because if you know what they're actually looking for, not what they're asking for, then you can give them that other information. And that's actually an audit term we'll, I'll talk about here in a few minutes. So know your compensating controls, and actually that's what I'm talking about right now. So a compensating control is, I say that my password and that is, is uh, timeout is 40 minutes, but within my applications I'm doing a five minute timeout. That's compensating for the fact that your Active Directory is a lot higher. Well, what they're really getting at is, does somebody have the ability to walk into this office of the CFO and change financial data? Well, if they're just going based on your Active Directory settings, they're going to say, yeah, if he goes out to lunch, I got a 40 minute window that I can come in and do that. But if you say, well, no, what you're really concerned about is the financial payroll application, and you want to know, can somebody walk into his office after he walks out and change data? Oh, well, it times out after five minutes, so it's actually okay. Oh, okay. Well, now your auditor has a better understanding of your control environment that they didn't know because they didn't ask the right question to begin with. Um, and, and so understanding your compensating controls and knowing what a compensating control is very critical in saying no to your auditors. Also, you have to understand the severity of the finding. Going back to what audit findings were and I told about the three levels, when you have an audit finding that's a reportable condition, this is pretty severe. This is, this is not enough for the auditors to say that your financial statements are complete junk and nobody should invest in your company, um, but it's enough that they're going to put it in that audit report that goes out annually to all investors. And, and do you really want your investors to be reading through your con security controls and saying, oh, wow, they don't do that? Uh, depending on your, your, your industry, that could be very bad. You know, if you're in a manufacturing industry and you don't have controls over quality control, that might have a huge impact on, on your uh, company's ability to sell its product. So you, if your investors are reading that, you don't have the ability to do your co quality control. They may say, well, financially the company's sound, but going forward, they may start losing a lot of business because their products aren't coming out the right way because they don't have the proper security controls. And if it's a security control, I can guarantee that the C-level is going to come to the CISO and say, which one of your people did this wrong? And then they're going to be headhunting for the person on the, down in the totem pole that they can, can blame to get rid of. So if you have these severe findings, what you really want to understand is when you go to say no to audit, you better have all those compensating controls lined up and be able to explain why what they found isn't necessarily bad. And they also may not understand the impact of what they're telling you. So if they hear on the internet, you know, they're reading through an article about this vulnerability and it can give somebody the ability to do this, well, if you explain to them, well, yes, but, and then you go into why it's not as severe as what they read on the internet, then you have a better chance of them accepting your no, this is not an issue, then if you just say, well, you don't understand the technology, there's no way you could understand the severity of the impact. You know, that's not going to go over well. You're going to drop. And, and that goes to the last comment I have here about remaining calm and confident. You know, when you say no to auditors, and it's a very severe finding, they're going to be a lot more tense towards you. They're going to really focus in on what are your compensating controls. Because if you can't give me anything good, we're going to have to put this in the report. Um, if you come in combative, 
and a know-it-all, they're just going to shut you out. It doesn't matter if you're right or not. They won't listen to you. So it's important that you go calm and confident. You know, know that what you're compensating controls are what they are and that they meet and mitigate the issue at hand. Um, that way, they're more apt to say, okay, I can see what you're saying and it's probably not as severe. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to wipe it away completely. They may say, okay, well, we had this, we had this reportable condition. Now we're going to make it a management letter finding because you do have the compensating control but you didn't do what you said you were going to do. So it's a little less severe, and your boss is probably going to be a lot more happy that it's not a report, audit report finding as opposed to a management letter finding. Um, so it's, it's key to know what the severity of the, the finding is, the type of person you're dealing with, and then when you push back and say, well, no, you're not right on that because of this, that you have all the information and that you're willing to give it to them. Because if you're willing to give it to them and show them and explain it to them so that they can understand it, they're a lot more likely to say, okay, I can see where you're coming from. We can either wipe this away because, yeah, you're right, this does completely mitigate it. Or at least we really want you to look at your controls that you've written down that you say you do and, and kind of fix those then. So that's where it may drop down farther even into like a, a, a verbal finding to say, we'll go back and rewrite your uh, control standards. Um, and so the important thing, and I know this happened to me all the time when I was an auditor, I would go in, I would audit somebody, and then I would get yelled at. You're an idiot. You're a bozo. What are you doing here? You have no idea what we do. My boss is going to kill me. And, and you know, you can come out as an auditor feeling pretty degraded. Um, <laughs> I told my kids, I'm like, you can say just about anything to me and it won't hurt my feelings because I've heard everything. I've been called everything. I've been told how incompetent I am, despite the fact that I've shown the people their own settings. So it can be very demoralizing. But what's important to understand that when you're dealing with your auditors, I understand this is your hard work. I mean, I'm on that side now too. I have auditors coming to me and telling me, you know, you need to do this and why didn't you do this? This is your hard work. You put your time and effort into it. And your boss is going to hear if the control that you're in charge of isn't working. But audits aren't personal. Your auditor, for the most part, 99% of the time, aren't coming in saying, hmm, Jeff, you did this wrong because I don't like you. That shouldn't be the case. If that's happening, then you need to talk to your management, and they need to talk to the management of, of their audit staff. It shouldn't be personal. It should just be about what you've done, what you said you were going to do, and then the fact that it didn't match up. And if you keep that in mind, when you're saying no to your auditors, you're not saying no to them personally. What you're doing is you're telling them why their understanding isn't accurate. And that's not a personal level thing. Auditors can't know everything the way, same way that technologists and security people can't know every aspect of security. So you have to remember that the guy coming in with a checklist who just came out of college doesn't really understand my systems. However, he doesn't understand them because nobody's taught him. Um, the other thing is that don't just accept it because audit says it. I hear this all the time when I was an auditor. Actually, I had one audit that I was doing that I told the lady, you know, that we were having a finding because their teachers weren't um, submitting the proper forms. And she said, well, can you come in and tell them? Because if they hear it from an auditor, they'll do it. And just because I'm an auditor doesn't mean it's right. I mean, if you can tell me why I'm not right, that's fine, but also it shouldn't come from me as this is audit telling you to do it. I mean, these are your controls. You should be going to your staff and saying, hey, I told you you need to turn in these reports. You're not doing it. Do your job, please. So just because audit says it, audit's not the end-all be-all. They don't know everything. Going back, they only know what you tell them. So it's okay to say no, knowing that they don't know everything. And with respect to the grim trigger, there's two. They, you always hear there's two things that are certain in life: taxes and death. There's actually three. The, the auditors will be back next year. If you're getting audited, they're always going to come back. Might not be the same person, might not be the same manager, but they are coming back, and they're going to look at the exact same thing that they did last year. And so it's important for your forward relationship that even if you push back on audit and tell them no, and try to work with them through it. They're going to come back, 
And as I said before, it's not personal, but if you make it personal this year, it'll be personal in the future. So it's important that you stay, you know, going back to what I said, um, remain calm and confident. It's important that you do that because when they come back, if you've taken the right approach, they'll work with you. And actually, they may come to you before things escalate to tell you, oh, this doesn't look right. Can you kind of explain it to me a little bit more? You'll find that your working relationship with your auditor will actually get better because they, they understand that you're trying to help them as well as they're trying to help you. Um, so with that, are there any questions? All right. Well, don't be afraid of the auditors. That's all.